happening on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? It's David. Listen, you're getting a cornucopia of podcasts this week. <laughs> a cornucopia. One on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, and one on Thursday. Now, we put one out on Wednesday. Uh, Robert Fisk, a man I got to know pretty well over the years. Uh, really shocked to hear his passing. We did a lovely conversation with Robert about Saudi Arabia. And uh, if you fancy listening to Robert Fisk, and you always should, uh, a great loss to journalism and uh, hearts go out to his wife, also Nellifer, very, very interesting woman, very lovely woman. Anyway, have a listen to that podcast. But today, it's all America, Johnny boy. What did I tell you, Mac? What did I tell you? you? Did, I've been you saying did. it all the way through, never discount Trump. And in fairness, like we spoke to Kev earlier on the week, we talked about the polling and all the polls had Biden, not way up, but, you oh, know. Pretty much, pretty yeah, much. you know, between, what, four, five and four, ten Four and eight percent. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And I, it, it never sat well with me. It never sat well with me. So it still remains to be seen if... We're who, down the war now, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. So it, it remains to be seen who if he's going to make it or not. But just don't discount him until the very end. Gives a very, very different interpretation of the expression going postal, doesn't it? <laughs> But there you go. Listen, let's go straight. It's all America today. We don't know who's really winning. We don't know who's won, let's say, at the end. I don't think anybody does. But let's go all the way to Kansas, to Kansas City, to Tom Frank. Tom Frank, talk to me. Talk to me. How's your head? How are you feeling? Uh, 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 Mr. McWilliams. <laughs> What's going I'm on? Fine. I, I drank plenty of water. I interspersed my bouts <laughs> of, uh, of, of, you know, beer consumption with water. So I'm fine. Uh, and, uh, and look, I think it's a great day when the entire political establishment of America gets proven wrong again. I love that. <laughs> that, makes, that puts a big smile on my face. <laughs> I, you know, I love to see that happen. And, and the good thing is it happened and it looks like Trump is not going to be <laughs> reelected. So best of both worlds. What happened? Talk to me. Cause you know, we're, we're, look, we're trying to make some sense of your country. Well, it looks like, well, first story is all the, all the political experts were wrong. Okay. So they said it was going to be a overwhelming democratic victory. They said, uh, you know, it was, if not a landslide for Biden, I love it when political science just does a complete face plant, which is what they did. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. And I, I don't know what went wrong for them. I mean, I'm not a pollster. I don't follow that. You know, I don't I don't I don't do any of that kind of thing. But it is hilarious that it's now happened two elections in a row. Clearly, Trump is a wild card. I'm inclined to think it's because um, there's a social stigma attached to him. And I think that we have been underestimating the, uh, it, you know, everybody says this election is a referendum on Trump. And so, so it is, right? But it's also a referendum on us, on the liberals, on, I, I'm not you, I mean, but, and not me either, really, but on the kind of people who, you know, the politics of scolding, what I write about all the time. This is so offensive to people. I mean, how can a guy, Trump is this close to being reelected. This is a failed president. This is a guy that, you know, has no idea what he's doing, absolutely bungled the pandemic. The economy is in free, you know, was, I mean, he bailed out his friends, right? They, they did fine. Everybody else is like, every restaurant in Washington, D.C. is going out of business. It, you know, it's a disaster for everybody else. He, he just about got reelected. That's incredible. That tells you two things. First of all, there's something else going on here. Usually the economy, the pandemic, that's all that decides, right? It's, yeah. I think I said that to you before. Fundamentals. Something else is going on, and it's still the culture wars. The culture wars are still incredibly powerful. And we, the liberals, walked right into the buzzsaw, spent the last four years calling him a Russian agent when he was nothing of the sort. There's no evidence for it. Yeah, he's a blowhard, and he's a jerk, and he's an asshole. But wh <laughs> yeah. why not stick but he with that? He isn't you know, KGB material. He's not KGB <laughs> exactly. material. They're, exactly. They're why, why, yeah, I know. 
sucks. <laughs> and, and, and calling him a dictator. Like the guy had every chance to become a dictator in this pandemic. Like people are calling for him to go out there and do a national clampdown or whatever. And he won't do it. You know, he's not a yeah, dictator. So he doesn't, he it's doesn't like, have he's that. really bad. He's a terrible president, but he's not like this nightmare Hitler, Stalin, you know, uh, mashup. You know, he's not that. No, I mean, uh, and the interesting <laughs> thing is he doesn't have, it's very, I mean, because it's very easy to caricature, he doesn't have that autocratic urge to clamp down, to shut down, to do all these sort of things. But I, or he would have used it, but he, he does have, he, he does, he is a loud mouth and he is a, I mean, he'll say anything and he'll tweet anything. Uh, and he's, a, and he's incompetent and he's a fool, but like that wasn't good enough for the Dems. No, they had to go around and build this entire stereotype of the Trump voter, insult these people, uh, build this social stigma around him. Uh, you know, you haven't been in America in, in recent years, but the, the climate of, you know, my friends have been canceled. You know, friends of mine have felt the sort of wrath of the of the um, of the of the, the, poli- the woke, woke of the woke of the of the politically self righteous. It, it's utterly and absolutely unfair, and that's just for starters. I mean, there's so many chapters to what has happened in the last four years, all of them offensive. And I say this as a leftist, as someone who like <laughs> agrees with like I agree with Black Lives Matter. You know, I agree with uh, with 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 a lot of these people on a lot of things. But it's it's just like it's staggering, and it's all to avoid looking the facts of 2016 in the face, anything to avoid that. And those facts are that the Democratic Party is losing its grip on the working class. Uh, And I don't just mean the white working class anymore. That's what I used to say, but look at what's happening. And the Latino Latino working class is moving towards Trump and some of the African-Americans. Yep. But certainly the Latinos are. Slowly, I mean, it doesn't take much. I mean, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot with uh, with 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 those two groups, if the, because they're so overwhelmingly democratic. The Democrats completely rely on them, and then you, you the Democrats go out there and nominate this guy, Biden, who's totally lackluster. I don't know if you've been following the news from America the last couple of weeks. Trump is doing these enormous rallies, like five of them yeah. every day. Yeah. Biden is doing nothing, nothing. And look, I don't know if that if that by itself had any kind of impact, but I bet it did. You know, that's that's incredible that a man who just had COVID and is how old is he? Seventy five years old or something is going around the country doing this. That's unbelievable. And, uh, you know, what is it about the Democrats that they're always drawn to these feckless, you know, these personalities that do nothing, that promise, that have no big ideas, that promise very little, that are just like, okay, nothing's going to fundamentally change. Remember Biden's notorious remark? By the way, I only recently, I, to my great shame, I only recently started looking at Biden's advisors. You know who is advising him? It's like all my all my liberal friends are like, oh, maybe when he gets in, he'll he'll show his progressive side. No. He's, his advisors are like like all these Clinton admi- administration it's all, retreads. It's, it's all the it's 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 the kind of Larry Summers, Rob Rubin types. I don't know yeah. if it's those guys yeah. actually, yeah. but it's those it's, type no, of guys. It's not, it's not those guys. Actually. But it's yeah. the Harvard, it's and, the Harvard, Wall Street, Washington uh, triumvirate, and you see well, that the all one the, that, time. the one that blew my mind is when I realized it's the architect of Clinton's welfare reform. Is his like oh, this closest is the welfare domestic as we, welfare as well, we don't know and, and welfare and welfare as we know it, which was <laughs> exactly. like one of the one of the cruelest things that a Democrat has ever done, and and that guy is advising you know no so so the, so the point is the point is he the, just the expected to cruise saying, right back in to do nothing different cruise right back in he was going to eke out a little narrow victory by winning over suburban white collar highly educated voters uh he didn't even try you know to put uh, put together the old um roosevelt coalition the old new deal you know they don't even they don't even try to do that anymore so so and, let, let's let's think of it. so you say like so at the moment the narrative is and tomorrow morning the next day because it does look like biden might sneak it by a couple of votes right or a couple of a couple, yeah a couple it looks of, like right? it looks like okay. he's going to but the yeah. narrative is going to see this was a referendum on donald trump and by a sliver the people rejected it whereas you're saying no 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 hold on a second this was not a referendum just on Donald Trump. It was a referendum on the people who spend their summer holidays in Martha's Vineyard. Hell yes, absolutely. Because uh, if you, 
You live in America and you turn on one channel and it's all Trump all the time. That's Fox News. You turn on another channel and it's they're scolding you constantly, telling you what a fool you are, what an asshole you are. That's CNN or that's MSNBC. And that is the uh, that is the the little cultural universe that we live in here in America now. And you know, if you're like me, well, they both disgust me, but for most Americans are, you that's, know, they're that's either why you're on here. That's why you're on here. <laughs> I know. I have to go to Ireland to have the, you know, to have somebody listen to me, you know? <laughs> I, listen, I was on French TV last night. I there was a time when I used to be on the radio and on TV in this country. No, but, no, no. no, you're, no, you know, no what happens? It's, it's no, no, what happens is you go niche, then you go fringe, and then you go straight back to mainstream. It's gonna happen, man. <laughs> <laughs> I can I, I, I can know, give I you the playlist. It. I've done that gig. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but listen, oh so where, where are we going to be? I, I can see, because by the way, we're, we're, we're having a chat. Uh, Tom is clearly in his parents' house in Kansas. I am, yeah, in I Kansas see your mother, City, yeah. I see your dad yeah. walking around behind. <laughs> <laughs> he, ju- he just turned 92 years old. He, we, I'm here for his birthday. He oh, turned 92. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. And tell me, how it is was... he feeling about the whole thing? Well, he... Um, I th- I think he supported Trump and he's he's I think he's feeling I, I don't know I haven't told him this morning that looks like Trump's going to lose. Don't but tell he, him. Uh, my dad is a great man but he uh, the the funny story is he um, he was born in 1928. Wow. A few a few days before the election so Calvin Coolidge was president but Herbert Hoover was about to be elected in a landslide and uh Herbert Hoover was a great national hero, and so my his, his my grandmother named my dad for Herbert Hoover. Is he Herbert <laughs> Frank? Running, no, it's his middle name. I but he's one this. of the he's one of the only like I went to the Herbert Hoover Library a while ago, and nothing in America is named for Herbert Hoover because, as you know, the Great Depression then yeah, took yeah, place, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and he was hated forevermore. But uh, uh, in that brief period in twenty eight, he was still a hero. And it was <laughs> Herbert Hoover, uh, your man Mellon, I told you about. Yeah, Mellon. Yeah, yep. you know the story. Yeah, and the economist uh, Irvin Fisher. Who, yes. uh, the lesson uh, it, to all economists, don't come out publicly absolutely certain of things. Because when things go wrong, Irvin Fisher yeah. was the biggest economist in the right. United States. Like the, yeah. like the cap of the tutti capi. And he screwed up but, on, but, the, on, wait, the, on the Great David, Depression. Ever, have you ever thought about it this way? It, we're, we're kind of fortunate that, that that guy discredited himself. The entire economics profession in this country discredited themselves in those days. And we're lucky they did because that allowed Roosevelt to just sweep them aside and bring in people that were regarded at the time as cranks. This yeah, is that's true. K- K- Keynesianism. Yeah, he, Otherwise, he would never have had an opening for, for Keynesianism. Otherwise, he'd still be on the gold standard. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. That's right. And, your, uh, and your friend Brian Jennings would have been still in the background. Yeah, Jennings Brian. Yeah, Jennings yeah. Brian. You yeah, and Brian Jennings. Right. Actually, Brian yeah. Jennings was a bloke in my primary school. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, this is, I'm here in a state that, that Brian carried. This is Brian country out here. But this is Kansas. When, Ka- when Kansas was radical. When Kansas yeah, was they, radical. They, they loved him. There's my dad. There's hey, your dad. dad. How are you these, doing? Are, these are guys in Ireland. These How are, are you? guys in Ireland. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I kid you, I kid you not. He can't yeah. get a gig anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> How did Kansas vote, by the way? Did you all go for Trump? Uh, yeah, I did. Here's the local newspaper. Still counting. Well, at least they're hedging yeah. their bets. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, but, listen, no, they, but, but, but this county that I'm in is one of those wealthy suburban counties and that the, the, the Democrats have been trying to win and they did win. So Biden won here. And the, I looked it up. The last, this is when I was growing up, I grew up here. This was one of the most Republican places in America, like went for Barry Goldwater, went for Ronald Reagan. And um, the last time it voted for a Democrat was 1916, 104 oh, wow. years. Yeah, 104 years ago. And it hasn't, Kansas is very, very Republican. So you're, it, it, so you're in the sort of it, place where the PhD per square mile index is very, very high. Well, and they're now yeah, all voting. It, yeah, so they're, yeah. they're kind of, they're the kids of rich Republicans who got really yes. hyper educated and now yes. like the whole Wokipedia stuff and are voting yes, Democrat. But, but but they don't but they but so they a guy like Biden is perfect for them. They're like they're they're you know they've all got they've got you know Black Lives Matter banners in their front yard, but they don't want, you know, they're worried about the deficit. <laughs> <laughs> You know they don't. They don't want that. They don't want that universal health care. They don't want that. No, 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 no. no. (laughs) Biden's going to veto that. I was just thinking last night. I was talking with my friends. It's like Biden could have had it in a landslide if he just said, "Okay, 
As soon as I get in, everybody gets health care. You don't have to worry about it. We're going to get out of this a- epidemic. Everybody gets universal health care. You don't have to worry about surprise billing. You don't have to worry about going bankrupt. It's done. As yeah, soon as I get it, it would have, you know, you know what? He, yeah. You know what would have happened? <laughs> it's like, this would have been this crushing victory, you know? And, uh, and no, instead he's like, no, we're going to like fiddle with Obamacare. We're, you know, this system that nobody understands. We're going to tinker with it around the edges and like make it slightly more affordable for this group. But it has to be means tested for this other group. And, you know, no, no one wants that. But listen, Tom, in terms of analysis, right? In the yeah. next four years, even if Biden sneaks it, Trumpism is here to stay. Yes, yes. And the neurosis in the Democratic Party is not going it's away. Also, exactly, because they will not listen. Remember the title of the book, Listen Liberal. They won't. <laughs> and what about Trumpism? It's either, well, well, some of my friends are saying that Trump himself will try again. And I think he'll be too old in 2024. But his son, Don Jr., his daughter, Ivanka, they both have ambitions. Tucker Carlson. There's a, a whole bunch of Republican senators who, who are, but they're all miniature Trumps. It's just, they're smarter than Trump. Trump is, you got to remember, Trump's a fool. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this guy doesn't have, you know, he doesn't even know how to do politics. He's, he does these rallies and people like him, but uh, he does not know how to do politics. And a real politician would, would with, with Trump's, you know, uh, doing what Trump has done, you know, reaching out, reaching out for the working class in all these ways, other than economic, <sighs> they're going to win. That's, that's going to succeed down the road, you know? So you Biden, against- Joe Biden could be the last Democratic president for oh, a long oh, time. Oh, come on. No, who, who the hell knows? Who the hell knows? That's impossible to say. Look, you've got a two-party system locked in by law in this country doesn't matter how bad the Democrats get, and it doesn't matter how crazy the Republicans get. They always have a chance. You got to remember that. They all, it doesn't matter. They always have a chance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Our, uh, Tom, listen. Mr. I will, Mr. McWilliams. We will talk I to gotta you. I got to go. Gotta go fly. Go fly. We'll see you. Happy flight and all that safe. Uh, wear a mask. No, don't wear a mask. because I be, am going to wear a mask. You'll be hissed at in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tom. Good to talk to you. All right. Take Cheers, care, Tom. See you later. Okay, so that was Tom there having a go, John, at posters, big time. Yeah, but I think he's so he, funny, isn't he? Yeah, but he's 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 got it in one. It's his idea. It's not just a referendum on Trump. Yeah, as all the liberals want to say, it's a referendum on the liberals too. And frankly, nobody comes out of this smelling of roses at all. Yeah, yeah. But come here. You mentioned the Clinton welfare thing. Can you remind me of that? So. Clinton was obsessed by what he called triangulation. And this was Clinton's big strategy, was to try and find the place between the Republicans and the hard line, which he would describe as Democrats, Mm. i.e. the more left Democrats, find the small space that he could get into. And he tacked to the left initially with his health care reform. We wouldn't regard it as left at all. We would think it's totally normal. But, you know, I mean, (laughs) they call it reform. It's like, to having public health care. Yeah, well, we kind of consider left is normal, don't we? Yeah, well, that's <laughs> it's true, actually. But and Hillary Clinton was the prime mover in his health care reforms. Right. And that's when Hillary Clinton began to become the target of the right. And you might know, I interviewed her a couple of years later. Yeah. And it was very much part of the background noise in the interview, it was very clear to me, even talking to her, that she was very tetchy about the right. But she was actually also incredibly uh, funny and giggly off camera, which was a strange, yeah, yeah. and really good fun, giggly. Then on camera, she went into this sort of presidential mode. The many faces of Many faces. But so what Bill Clinton was trying to do, Bill Clinton engineered what Tom Frank doesn't like which is the centralization or the centrist dad approach. You know this expression, centrist dad? Yeah. They have the UK. That he would go to the center, right? Yeah. And part of that was he was being dragged by Newt Gingrich, you might remember. I do remember Over to the right. Mm. So Clinton thought, well, how do I actually get back to the center? The right wing are talking all about welfare cheats, et cetera, Mm. uh, to which the great Neil Young came out with a great song, called Welfare Mothers Make Best Lovers in response to the right wing. <laughs> this is all the sort of weird shit you get on this thing. But uh, he tried to dismantle the welfare system. So the big idea was that 
tried to make welfare conditional on behavior. Right? Okay, yeah. And his slogan was welfare, but not as we know it, or welfare as we know it now. That was the idea. Okay, the changed right. idea. Yeah. Now, of course, that was basically to drag the Republicans, or the, the, to push the Republicans away, to drag the Democrats into the center, but also, interestingly for economics, to appease the bond market, because the bond market had consistently been aggressively anti-Clinton. Right. And every time he tried to increase welfare budgets or health budgets, they would sell the long bond, they'd sell the US bond. So there was this idea of bond vigilantes who were policing okay. the Democrats on behalf of the Republicans. This is a big thing. This is a real thing in the 1990s, wow. which is why uh, James Carville, did you ever hear of the Raging Cajun? Uh, I'm going to say no. The Raging Cajun was a Cajun guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> called, it's like University Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Raging Cajun was a guy called James Carville. Came up with two great expressions, right? <laughs> Regarding the bond vigilantes yeah. who were policing the White House by attacking the Clinton regime or the Clinton administration. He said, he said, when I come back, if there's ever reincarnation, I want to come back as the bond market with, <laughs> with a big stick. Because they were so powerful. Yeah, yeah. He also, interestingly, said something about Pennsylvania. Because, you know, if you look at Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is named after William Penn. Mm -hmm. Who was originally from East Cork? Right, okay. That's where he was born, right? William Penn was born now. in East Cork, right? Shangari, you know that place? Yeah. Shangari, that's yeah. where he was born, right? Pennsylvania, Philadelphia is the home of the American Constitution. Mm. This is a place. So when you think of Pennsylvania, you think it's kind of up there beside New York, it's up there beside you know, the Northeast. Yeah, yeah. And you, you get the sense that it's a Northeastern state, but Carville described it beautifully. Very Clinton-esque. He says, Pennsylvania, there's two big cities, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Yeah. He said, it's like New York in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, and the rest is Alabama. <laughs> nice, and that's what we're nice. seeing. That's yeah. what we're seeing now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, all good. So that was, that, was the, that was the Clinton expression. Right. Do you know the other big story of the election that no one's talking about is Kanye. Kanye got 57,000 votes in total, in total. So... But he's not put off by it. He says he's coming back in 2024. Now, I'm not sure if it's going to be him or the hologram. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, America's so mental. It's not inconceivable that the Trump family office will fight the next election. Ivanka yeah. are the... Are the oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I think that's a strong possibility. And Kanye... And your one Kardashian. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of mad. It is a big reality TV show. Yeah, yeah. And fascinatingly, it'll be interesting to see who the Democrats come up with. Oprah. There you go. Yeah. On the couch. On the couch, yeah. There the Oprah go. book club. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, but you see, could you imagine if it was Oprah versus Ivanka versus yeah. Kanye? Okay, imagine the polls. yeah. Faced with that, imagine all the nerds, all the people who talk about policy and economics and the bond market and the budget deficit, and you've got these three yeah. going for it. You know, if the polls got it wrong this time... But you know what might happen is that, that Trump might set up his own polling organisation and it'd be totally different to everybody because else. Fake polls. <laughs> fake polls. You can keep your polls. But speaking of fake polls, it's not often that I can say that one profession are less credible than economists. <laughs> There are weathermen, weatherwomen, economists, and that top of the feckin' pile, there are pollsters. Pollsters. Pollsters, Man. pollsters. Yeah. We've got one of them on now, Kevin, Kevin Cunningham. We've been bigging you up. <laughs> We've been bigging up your trade even for quite some time. We're looking at the American numbers. Now, in fairness, you did give us a heads up. You did give us a warning that the polls could be wrong. Kev. explain your trade. Explain what's going on, because it, it looks to me like this is... You remember when most of the economists in the world didn't see the 2008 financial crisis coming? This strikes me as something broadly similar for polls. It's a big crisis. It's a huge crisis. You know, a lot of these polling companies would have adjusted. They would have been very conscious of the mistakes that were made in 2016 and for the mistakes to go again in the same direction. I mean, 
bear in mind, you know, the polls in Michigan were staggeringly large leads. And even at that, they were still trying to be cautious about possibilities of how things might or might not go the right way. Uh, there's a couple of plausible explanations for this. There's the shy voter, which people talk about. I don't believe that really at all. In fact, I mean, a lot of polls are conducted online and there's no discernible shyness among Trump supporters. Uh, and any sort of mechanism to try to understand whether they are shy has failed to kind of see that. And also, you know, when you're able to ask someone how they voted last time and they say they voted for Trump and then they say they're voting for Trump again this time, then you should be able to capture that kind of shy effect. The bigger problem is definitely about turnout. And this has always been the problem with public opinion polls. I think I might have mentioned this uh, previously, but, you know, the people that respond to opinion polls, especially, say, telephone polls, where only one in 20 are actually answering the phone, are not people who are kind of everyday people. They're not people who are, you know, as engaged with politics. So, you have to make a lot of adjustments and you have to try to figure out what those voters look like. So to my mind, the big mistake was if you if you look at these polls as they were prior to the election, Biden was retaining 95 or 96 percent of the Clinton 2016 vote. Trump was equivalently retaining a very similar percentage. The reason why it was predicated that Biden was going to win this election was because he was winning lots of people, according to the polls, uh, lots of non-voters and other voters or whatever. And I think the problem in polling is an inability to actually capture a representative picture of that non-voter. He was winning two to one, but actually evidently that doesn't appear to have been the case. I mean, he's done re relatively well among older voters, as the poll suggested. He's done relatively worse among Cubans and uh, African-Americans. But how those people have turned out or not turned out hasn't been appreciated by the polling companies at all, in fact. Uh, one of the interesting assertions, I think, in polling is that, you know, it's very difficult. And I was chatting to uh, one major polling company that completely got it wrong and is usually very good. Is they had difficulties in trying to find African-Americans, same as last time. And the problem with that is we have this assumption that, you know, if in previous elections, say 90% of African-Americans or, or a very high proportion of Latinos vote a certain way, then the assumption is that, oh, well, sure, if only the rest would turn out, then we'd get a much higher support for our party. Well, actually, what, what a lot of that is, is if you think about it, why aren't they voting? They're not enthusiastic about the, their preference. It's not just socioeconomic reasons for for less likely to turn out. But actually, if you think about it, all the evidence suggests that there are psychological, almost genetic reasons for people to be left or right. And so to assume that everyone who is African-American or everyone who is Latino is instinctively left-wing and agrees with the policy agenda of the left-wing party, the Democrats, I think that's, that's a false assertion. So when that demographic does increase in turnout, I think you're more likely to find more people who are just naturally... Uh, more right of centre, whether that be on the economy or whatever it might be. Um, and I think those are the people that have maybe surprised people when they suddenly turned out, when they got you know, excited by uh, Donald Trump, I guess. Um, and, and perhaps because maybe maybe they're, maybe they're doing better than they were previously. I, I, I really don't know about that. But, you know, when they have turned out in larger numbers, it appears that that thing has balanced out a little bit more between, you know, the relative support for Democrat or Republicans. And I think that's that's a major feature of where polling has got wrong uh, in, in this particular election. Well, it's interesting, Kev, because in all of these populist versus establishment, let's say, dogfights, whether it's in the UK or whether it's in the US, and, and even Le Pen up until the very last round in France, okay, when it just became an either R, what seems to be the case is the polls overestimate the establishment old school character and they underestimate the popular insurgency and this seems to be like a, a fault that we've seen again and again so interestingly it's not that they didn't pick up people who didn't vote in the past or it's not that they didn't pick up people who were encouraged to vote now is they defaulted to a position that doesn't seem to make any sense even given what we know in the last five or six big elections worldwide yeah, I, I think you're on to a very interesting point there. And actually, it's something I hadn't really quite considered until you mentioned it. But 
if you think about the question, there's a question that always that is really successful at predicting whether someone's going to vote for a, a populist party or not. And it's the question of, do you think uh, the people rather than politicians uh, should be running the show, running the country or whatever it might be? Um, and people who are kind of populist tend towards this idea of the people. I mean, what the people actually means is a, is a, is a side point. But it, it stems from a lack of trust in the system and lack of trust in, in the establishment and, and that sort of stuff. And I think when I'm asking someone like as a pollster to engage in a public opinion poll, they tend to be people who feel that there is a point to contributing their opinion. There is, you know, they have some level of trust in the system and some level of trust in the subject. Like there's a whole, you know, there's a lot of people who would vote for um, Brexit party and uh, lots of kind of populist parties. But there's actually another rake of people that never vote even, even outside them who are completely disaffected by the, by the system. Like they don't even touch the political system at all. They don't care at all. And, you know, they only rarely come in on massive waves. I don't know if this is that kind of wave, but, you know, I'm always wary of, you know, when we do a poll, we really don't account for those people. I mean, there's lots of people that are just impossible to get. I mean, even really at the fringes. I mean, you'll never have a homelessness of someone who's homeless in your opinion poll because, like, they don't have a home to answer the landline in the first place, right? Or, you know, you won't have people who are on holiday or people who are away or people who are in jail or any of those things. There's lots of just little reasons why people won't be represented in the poll. Um, and I think that's just another feature of this. But, you know, one of the reasons why I was kind of concerned, we were talking about this before, about the idea of doing a lot of chats with, with some switchers. One of the reasons for that was because 95% of people were voting for the same party in this election. And in, this, in the previous election, like 80,000 people switched it between Clinton and Trump. Like if, if 80,000 or 0.06% of the vote had, changed, had voted differently in 2016, you would have had Hillary Clinton as president. So like a lot of the narrative, I think, out of an election is focuses on, you know, oh, you know, the winner seems to write the story of what happened. But a lot of what's happening is really just this small number of people that are moving between the two parties. And I think those are the interesting people. And to be honest, I don't think you can actually get them, get their attitudes from merely an opinion poll. I think you need to talk to them. I, need, I think you need to really engage with them uh, in a much deeper level to try to see any similarities between the types of people that are deciding these elections. And Kevin, I mean, I know, I know, for example, that you did that. You decided, OK, there is this person out there who is neither left nor right, neither liberal nor conservative, neither Democrat nor Republican, is, uh, is, is a, a melange of different ideas. You went to the States, you did your own polling, you didn't go to the States, you went over Facebook, you did your own polling. What did you find out? I mean, who are these people who switched from, let's say, Clinton to Trump this time around, i.e. they would have been assumed a Biden voter, they went for Trump, and vice versa, somebody who would have been assumed a Trump voter who went for Biden. Who are the people? Just give me a, just a, a colour, a flavour, a sketch. Yeah, yeah, so uh, this is, you know, this is the key question, right, isn't it? So, as I say, I did this big poll try to identify that tiny number and then chatted with them on these half an hour Zoom conversations and in small groups, like I only had groups of two at most at any one time to try to really get and to talk to them in, in a personal way, like a large focus group and that sort of stuff. You're not, you're still going to run into problems where people are kind of conscious about what they want someone else to hear them say. So you want to make them feel as comfortable as possible and you need to, it takes a while to kind of get those real thoughts and kind of what you want to get, I think is, and you're never going to get this in an opinion poll is kind of them getting emotional about something. And that, and that's their kind of deeper feelings about something, right? So in terms of, let's say the, the Clinton Trump switch, right? I find that, I mean, it might've been a, a slight coincidence, but quite a lot of these were, were women in this particular case. And there are people who had voted for Clinton because they had liked Clinton as a female candidate. They spoke about that and they were unsure of Donald Trump in, in terms of the men because he was an outsider, whatever. Okay, so there were some men who voted for Trump this time who didn't vote for him last time because he was now a politician. So it's funny how his anti-establishment in the first case was a disadvantage to some people 
And for some others who, as I said, who had voted for Clinton last time, particularly women, they'd voted for her as a, wo- as a woman. But instinctively, when I'm talking to these people, they all were instinctively economically conservative. They were concerned about the economy more generally. Um, I spoke to one Cuban person, young woman uh, from Florida, who didn't vote in the previous election and had voted for Trump. And it was all about the economy. She was very concerned. None of them are like you're the type of person that you'd see, you know, with the Trump banner on the back of a pickup truck or whatever it is. Like it's absolutely not those types of people whatsoever. Um, And it's weird how the elections are often, you know, the narrative of an election is often built around the kind of evangelists of either party, but actually when they're determined by these people in the middle ground. So this Clinton Trump switcher is economically conservative, concerned about the economy. And we know from the opinion polls, as much as the opinion polls might be right, we can see at least in them that he does relatively well in relation to the economy relative to any other issue. And he and he he in fact leads on the economy relative to Joe Biden. Um and so that's definitely where they are. The other guys, the guys who've gone from Trump to Biden, uh, in some ways they're actually quite similar. They're again economically conservative, small C conservative, right? They voted for Trump because uh, as one person put it, they um have to look far behind the persona to see where his economic instincts are, right? But these guys uh, switched uh, to a person on the basis of coronavirus. And again, COVID is an issue where uh, Biden led Donald Trump by a significant amount. So they just said directly that they would have voted for Donald Trump if it weren't for uh, COVID. But that was the single thing. And again, if you go back again, okay, obviously the polls aren't the most accurate, right? But at least if you compare the polls in Pennsylvania in the lead up to the election where they were like, he was... Biden was five points ahead, at least, right, to before the crisis uh, with coronavirus hit, Donald Trump was doing five points better. I mean, if you go back to February, any reasonable analysis of this election would suggest that Donald Trump was well on his way to winning it because he was level in the states that he needed to win and any expectation of an incumbency bounce for Donald Trump was going to lead him in that direction. I thought this whole thing about, I described Biden as a placeholder. They didn't agree with the Democrats, they all, even the ones who switched from one direction to the other, all seem to be quite concerned about the left-wing features of the Democrats. Now, personally, I kind of like AOC and all those guys, but, you know, these guys definitely didn't. They they were very anxious about that subset of the Democratic Party, and they didn't agree with the Democrats ideologically. As one Ohio switcher from uh, Trump to Biden said, he buried his head in the sand, and it was his sacking of experts and put America behind the eight ball. So these are people who like appreciate the importance of the economy. And that's what they're actually all concerned about. But also, as one person put it, uh, you can't start the car if you don't have any wheels. Because I was concerned that, you know, over here, our narrative in relation to the coronavirus is like a bit of a balance between the economy and healthcare. You know, where do you stand on this spectrum? And in Ireland, Fine Gael, well, not Fine Gael voters, Fianna Fáil voters and Ain2 and the far right are more keen on the economic sphere. And, you know, the far left are actually the most likely to be cautious about COVID. But I found it interesting to find people who are economically conservative to be so concerned about COVID that they're driving their vote in that direction. But I wonder whether that's just because their experience with it has been very different. I mean, one of the people I spoke to in Michigan uh, had had COVID and she changed her mind because she'd had COVID and because she had voted for Donald Trump in the previous election was voting for Biden in this one. And again, like these are just a small number of people, but I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, if we're if we were to say that uh, getting rid of Donald Trump were to be a good thing, then perhaps COVID has had one significant impact uh, on, on, on the world in that respect. That's a really good place to, to close this 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 one down because it is it is fascinating, but we could go on for ages. But we've got a color, we've got a little vignette of who these people are. So listen, thank you so much. Thank you. So Kev, there, like when we had him on Tuesday, he talked about how they changed the approach to polling and how they came up with their results. I think they're going to need to change it again. Well, what I big took, time. What I, I think you're absolutely right. And what I took out of that was the question you came up with. That is the most telling question you can ask somebody these days is, do you think the president or the prime minister or the Taoiseach or the people should make decisions? 
and that reveals a huge amount of your preferences. It reveals a huge amount mm. of what you think about populism. And I come back to this idea of insiders and outsiders, John. That's what it's all about. The insiders, listen to Tom Frank, struggling yeah. with the same thing. The insiders cancel themselves out. And whoever speaks to this tiny, tiny disenfranchised outsiders, which is obviously getting bigger yeah. as each election happens, they're the people who win. Well, it's but it's interesting, though, because there is something like 30% or about 90 million evangelicals in the States. I call them American Taliban. And they don't give a monkey's about policy as such, because all they want, or indeed personality, all they want is to, the likes of overturn Roe v. Wade. They don't care how they get there at all. And they've, they've always said this. And this was also the big problem with Amy Cohn Barrett being appointed to the Supreme Court. So that's their game. And, and if it was Biden who was shouting and screaming to outlaw abortion and all that kind of stuff... Maybe they would for have, him. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it, it has at the end of empire feeling. I've always felt from the Romans... Yeah, when the Romans, doesn't it? The Romans ditched the gods and went for that Christianity malarkey. Yeah. It was over. It's the same stuff. Now, while I have you, while I have your ear... If you like the podcast, if you like what John and I are doing, if you like the stories, you like the research, if you want to learn economics, if you want to do a twice a month bespoke tutorial called Ask Mac, if you want to do the any questions and you want to listen and, and ask us questions, by all means, we would love to hear from you. So support us on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. It's probably the best few quid you're going to spend. <laughs> 